What's up, guys? Welcome back to Storytime with Uncle Reddit. My name's John, and this is r slash Tales from Tech Support. I don't know. I feel funny. Like, my mic is always in a different place. I don't know if I want it up here, down here, up here, over here. Or possibly tucked in. But anyway, we'll make it happen one way or the other. All right, let's do some tech support. Minor stresses of IT. User calls in, states they got a new phone, and need assistance with setting up their work email on the phone. Made them download Outlook app and tried to instruct them. However, user, who's in his 70s, is not tech savvy, so I try my best with no success, which leads to them telling me whatever I made them do, they no longer receiving emails in their personal email account and demands that I fix it. I told them that it wasn't touched and nothing I had them do interferes with the personal account. Their email is set up using the default mail app, but we're using Outlook, which they just downloaded. I asked if anyone nearby can assist, and they said no. I told them to go back to the nearby Apple store so they can assist. They began to cry and complain, and then hung up. Next day, I received a call with an apology. User was saying it wasn't my fault, and Apple store was able to fix their issue and add the email. Well, that's nice. It's not too many people, it's not too often that people will call back and admit that it wasn't your fault. You know, I can understand also on the other side being frustrated, not knowing what you're looking at or being familiar with the technology, whatever. Uh, I mean, I've had my fair share of issues, even though I can look things up on the computer. But yeah, sometimes you get frustrated and get a little heated and I don't think I've ever cried yet. Can't avoid getting blown up on. Editor's note, I work at a large hospital. Customer states they received a new smart card today following a name change. Since this happened, their user ID has also changed. First call, I change everything I need to in Active Directory so they can log in. No problems. Second call, customer states are unable to log into their charting software to do their job tonight and also had trouble logging into some hospital websites and Outlook. I downloaded certificates for Outlook for them to read older encrypted emails and fixed any issues with any websites they were having. When they asked again about the charting software, I stated that locally we have no control over the software accounts and that a ticket needed to be placed beforehand. Since that didn't happen, it can only be fixed during business hours, and it was currently 9 p.m. And despite me being as helpful as I possibly can be, fixing everything I was able to, I get blown up on because they absolutely needed to do their job and it was going to be a big issue. After some arguing from them, I explained that I would need their department head to contact my department head to go from here. After a text to my department head, he confirms exactly what I already said. I relay this back to customer's department head and bless their soul, they were cordial with me. I could tell in their voice they were trying to suppress their frustration. And I feel for them, but unfortunately, that's the way it goes. Maybe I should have just disabled their domain account because they didn't seem to think it mattered. Good lord, these people have no idea they're talking to another human being sometimes. I'm pretty sure this attitude's been around for millennia at this point, but it just seems... I, I think it's social media that does it. It seems that the attitude is much more noticeable these days, or, uh, yeah, much more noticeable. You know, this holier than thou, you owe me, you're beneath me, I'm better than you are, whatever. Y'all need to get over yourselves, and you know who I'm talking to. Since when did users ever listen to us? So I work as a level two desktop support, but I do a lot more outside that general scope. I just happen to be the unofficial lead tech on a major project for a very large construction company. So natural, people will move from project to project. The major projects tend to purchase domain names for their projects, as everyone here would know that in situations like that, it's pain free for a user to have their mailbox as so.andso at bigconstruction.com, then while on a major project, so.andso at majorproject.com as the email alias attached to their mailbox. Now, majority of people who move projects understand this is a fact of project life, much like death and taxes. I've recently encountered a very special user who might fall into the category of smart dumb. So, special user has moved from a major project I have nothing to do with as they have their own IT team to one of the two that I'm currently looking after. Naturally, special user gets an email alias for this project. Now normally, to ensure that the default from address is the new alias, we would create a new Outlook profile which would apply this alias. This is how the conversation went. SP equals special user, me equals, well, duh, me. I'll need to create a new profile on Outlook so you can send as your at newmajorproject.com. Special user, please don't as I still need to access my old emails from old major project. Me, no need to worry as they'll still be there as we don't create new mailboxes each time you move projects. Special user, 
Yes, but I don't want to lose my old emails. Oh, here we go. As you can guess, this ended being a potential endless loop. I ended up telling SP that we'll look at this later. You would think that this was the end. Oh, no. He had a, I'll even throw in some steak knives moment. How, you ask? Well, a special user thought they'd be a genius and tried to add at newmajorproject.com email alias to Outlook as a mailbox, then asked me why I wouldn't let him add it, complete with screenshot of the error. Once again, I patiently explained that at new major project isn't a new mailbox to add to Outlook. So to say that they're special is an understatement as I was informed today that special user was rather nasty to one of the service desk agents. So naturally being the one that takes care of the fun special cases, I took the jobs raised by them, downgraded the priority and placed them on hold as my way of putting them in IT timeout. I'm lucky that I can do that as I have a number of more pressing matters on my plate that take priority. Is it an a-hole move? Eh, it depends on how you see it. Well, OP, the way I see it is, there's, there's a difference between not getting something. I can understand that. It might be frustrating, but if you don't get it, you don't understand, I, I'm not gonna, I can't be super mad at that. Annoyed? Sure. But when they start getting nasty with people, now, that's where they deserve to be put on IT timeout or whatever you want to call it. There's no reason to be nasty about anything. If you're not understanding and you're not willing to listen, then and then you want to get angry, well, piss off. My boss is pathological. Context. I work in help desk at a four-year college in the U.S. Story. A few weeks ago, a professor called the help desk because the classroom PC wasn't turning on. When he called, there was only one tech in the office, and because of our policy of never leaving the help desk unattended, he was asked to put in a ticket, and the issue would be addressed ASAP. Someone was able to go by after lunch that day and fix the issue. Fast forward a week or so, I was in this professor's office helping him with a separate issue. As I get ready to leave, the professor asked if he can put in a formal complaint. He told me the story of how he called the help desk but was refused service and asked to put in a ticket. He said that when starting class and trying to get everything to work, that the last thing he wanted to worry about was putting in a ticket. I explained to him that when it comes to calls about classroom issues that we are first come first serve, and if someone calls before him with a similar issue that we have to go and help them first. This means that sometimes that while we do prioritize fixing issues that are preventing classes from happening, some issues will have to wait. Overall, we left things on good terms. He withdrew his complaint and understood. After that conversation, I went back to the office and informed my boss about what had happened, just so that he was in the loop. He then proceeded to state that the professor had no right to complain and that he was effing... <laughs> and that he was an effing moron. He then calls the professor and asks him to come by the help desk so that we could talk. When the professor came by, my boss berated him about how he needs to follow our policies when asked to put in a ticket and that he needs to just listen to us when we tell him to do something. He also told him that if he wanted to complain, that he should only talk to the help desk manager, my boss, and no one else. The professor was angered by this, obviously, and stormed out. We then received an email from the administration office about the encounter. This matter is still unresolved to this day. Long story short, I just don't understand how this matter went from being resolved to being the mess it is now. My boss took things way too personal, as he normally does, and blew this way out of proportion. Yeah. Management at its finest. So, you had things under control, you were being cordial, you explained everything, the professor may or may not have been on board, but they, they, were, they were okay for the time being. Letting your boss know was probably the right thing to do because this professor would probably come back later and do the same thing again. With that being said, your boss should have just left it at that. If something comes through again, if he starts his crap again or complains or, you know, wants to chew your ear off, whatever, uh, then you deal with it right then. And I would berate him at that point, but you already had it handled. He should have just, he should have just sat back and just let it go. But whatever. Boss is no best. Mm -mm. Personal drive space. Why is that so big? Man, I goofed that up. Oof. Huge company in the 2000s. I was responsible for the old NetApp filler, which was to be decommissioned with the data to be transferred to a new filler in two to three months. We were very close to capacity. It basically contained all the data drives that were used all the time, and each user's personal drive. I was actively scanning the capacity as free space diminished daily. I projected it forward, and we would run out of space before the transfer. So I set about with Tree Size Pro. I don't know what that is. Removing temporary files, duplicates, and anything and everything that I could get some space from. My attention turned to the personal drives. Tree size finds full. <laughs> Tree size finds 46 full feature films in the files. I suggest that we get rid of these. We can't touch the personal files, I'm told. IT cannot go there. But the whole system will fail if we don't. I've exhausted all of their options. HR was adamant. 
I was between a rock and a hard place. So I took a full backup and deleted the films, making a note to all IT that any requests for missing files in the personal drive should be sent to me. Guess what? No one asked for their Mad Max 3 rip to be restored. Not to mention, in fact, personal drive doesn't necessarily mean you get to put everything you want on there. I'd be quite shocked even back then if there wasn't some sort of rule in place that said, you know, you can't have this, you can't have music, you can't have whatever. You know, yes, it's your personal for work drive. Yeah, putting full featured films on there, I'm pretty sure that doesn't qualify, but whatever. And I'm quite sure the way they were ripped was probably illegal too, so what are they going to say? Unseasonably warm weather makes my monitor flicker. I used to work for a small company that had a few offices scattered around an older city. Blech. This was in an area with very mild weather, so a lot of these buildings didn't have air conditioning. It just wasn't worth the bother and expense to retrofit it into buildings where it would be used one week a year. Then, that one hot week, I got a call from one of the satellite offices. My monitor's flickering and it's giving me a headache. Could it be the heat? Can you come down and look at it? I think it needs to be replaced. I grabbed the spare monitor and put it in my car and drove down to the satellite office. Yup, the monitor was flickering alright, but when I turned off the cheap desktop fan sitting right next to the monitor, it stopped. Yup, running an unshielded fan next to an unshielded CRT monitor is going to make the image flicker. You should move the fan. Then I drove back to the main office and put the spare monitor back on the shelf. I'm glad they called you. I mean, because if they'd have tried to sort it themselves, they probably would have had all kinds of crap unplugged and it would have been a lot worse for you. But yeah, running unshielded stuff near those old CRT monitors. Actually, even sometimes on this PC with these monitors, um, I still get interference depending on what it is. With this microphone setup, you know, it's plugged into an interface, which then goes to the PC uh, via USB. So... If I have my cell phone sitting too close, it will, depending on what it's searching and what it's doing, if it's active, it will interfere and you'll hear a th -th 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 in the background of this audio. Uh, I've had it happen before, so I have to be careful where I put it. Right now it's sitting on the chair between my legs because it keeps vibrating and I just, I should turn it off, but yeah, whatever. So that's where failed print jobs go. This happened back in the early 1990s. Wow, we're going back in time. When our office still had only rudimentary LAN and the 386 was the best available computer. Instead of network printers, we still had individual printers cabled directly to a user's desktop computer. And only users who constantly needed a computer had a printer. Mostly secretaries. Also, I'm not knocking secretaries, just using the titles of the people involved. Our offices were laid out with a number of small shared offices, fronted by a large open area where the secretary desks were located. Due to furniture layout, a lot of people liked to take a shortcut through one secretary's space but they had to shimmy between her printer, which was on a stand, and the wall. Doing so often would knock that cable off the printer, and it was also leaving a scuff mark on the wall. The secretary was very good at her job and respected, but she had no aptitude for computer hardware. She would call us that her printer wasn't working, and we'd find that the cable was off. We showed her how to plug it back in, and she was fine with doing that. What she didn't understand was why she had to resend her print jobs after reconnecting the cable. She was used to mainframe computer systems with print queues, but her computer was standalone and was running DOS, so the system wasn't smart enough to realize that a print job had failed and to automatically resend it. We tried to explain all that and just get her to resend her print jobs, but she was still puzzled. Where did those print jobs go? Then one of our techs told her that electricity fo <laughs> oh my god. Then one of our techs told her that electricity flowed in that cable and pointed to the scuff marks on the wall. Told her that the print job electricity came out the end of the cable and was hitting the wall. Causing burn marks. <laughs> she bought that explanation and wondered if it was dangerous. He told her it probably was since it was burning the paint on the wall. After that, she was good about checking her printer cable and reconnecting it if it was loose. Probably better, she stopped allowing people to shimmy through that opening to keep them from getting hurt. Which meant the cable stayed on and we didn't have to keep coming back to reconnect it. <laughs> oh my god, that's too funny. Uh... I don't even have any words for this one. The electricity came out the wire. Oh my god. Whatever works, man. Whatever works. I finally found a way to have the users not ignore an outage email. This post, it's all about communication, reminded me. Thanks, you Jack's magic man. We use Outlook where I am, so if you don't, details may vary, but the principles should work. This should also work for unplanned outages, I think. But for a recent planned outage, instead of an email to all affected people, I set up a meeting as follows. Subject, XYZ outage. Body, info about what they can't do, reasons, timeframes, whatever, usual stuff. Setting, 
Show as free. This means it doesn't count as a clash with any actual meeting that might exist. Reminder, 15 minutes or whatever. This is also good for unplanned outages as they'll get the reminder immediately. Turn off any online hosting in Teams or whatever that might be on by default. This bit is important. This is what I mean by a blind meeting. Under response options, turn off request responses. This makes it show as no response required and stops their Outlook sending back their acceptance or rejection, preventing your inbox getting flooded with those. This also automatically turns off allow new time proposals. Optional, you can use the categorize button to make it show up in a different color on their calendar. No effect for recipients. See edit 3. Importantly, even if they do nothing at all, and even if the invite is filtered off to somewhere they don't look, the meeting with reminder pop-up will still appear in their calendar. Oh my god, the blessed silence during the outage was the best thing ever. Edit. A detail on allow new time proposals updated as per you, Black and 95s comments. Edit 2. Users can accept or decline, but either way, you won't see it. Thanks, you, Ryan LC. Edit 3. As speculated by you, enter the bugbear, and confirmed by you, okay, confirmed by another user, setting a category as the center of the invitation does nothing on the recipient side. Don't know what that last part meant. I get the general gist, though. Uh, basically, it's just the way that it shows up in their calendar. They can't fight it. They can't change it. They can't uh, call and bug you about it or at least email, whatever, um, it's hard for them to ignore. So good on you. All right, guys, thanks for sharing a little bit of your day with me. If you're on YouTube right here, we can see me waving at you. Do me a favor, click the like button, subscribe to the channel, leave me a comment down below. Uh, if you didn't like the story, go ahead and click thumbs down. We ain't scared around here. And if you're on the podcast format, whatever podcast provider you happen to use, do me a favor. If there's a way to rate us, can you do that for me? I don't care. Good, bad, whatever. Uh, it's just, I'd like to see what people like, what people don't like. And I like interacting with you guys as always have a great rest of your weekend and, uh, we'll see you on the next one.